I just sold my Canon C200 and bought a Canon C70 cinema camera to replace it. So in this video, I'm going to explain why I did that. Now I've owned a bunch of different cameras from different companies over the past 10 years, Canon, Sony, RED, and I've mainly used Canon cinema cameras as my main cameras for the past six plus years of running my video production company, filming YouTube videos, doing promo stuff for SwitchPod, et cetera. In March, 2019, I bought a C200 used for about $5,500. Now they were, I think 7,500 new when they first came out. And I've used that camera as my main camera for the past 21 months. But here are the 12 reasons why I sold my C200 to switch to the Canon C70. Number one, 10-bit 422 codex. This is something that should have been put in the C200 when it launched or through a firmware update later, but Canon basically just refused to do this. They have a 12 or 14-bit raw codec in the C200 and an 8-bit 420 codec to the SD cards. Give us something in the middle. I know they didn't want to probably cannibalize the C300 Mark II or III or C500 sales or what have you, but people want the 10-bit and if a basically if a camera is capable of doing raw, you could have figured out a way to put 422 in it. So the Canon C70 does offer 422 10-bit recording to SD cards. So that's the first reason. Reason number two, I'm gonna put in quotations because I haven't tested it yet, but this is one of the other main reasons. Better dynamic range. And I don't necessarily say it's gonna get more stops because they both use Canon Log 2 as the widest kind of gamma, picture profile to capture as much dynamic range as possible, but basically shooting to those SD cards instead of having to shoot raw, I'm gonna get better dynamic range in the 10-bit profile than in the 8-bit, but also because of the dual gain output, the DGO option that you can turn on and off, you're going to get the kind of dynamic range performance in the C70 that you get in a C300 Mark III, which is the only other Canon camera that has that DGO technology, which means Basically, each pixel can either be focused on highlight performance and retention of the highlights or shadow performance and in the darker areas. So it goes on a pixel by pixel, pixel basis and determines whether that is a bright pixel or a darker pixel and does you know the calculations that need to be done by a camera to make sure that that pixel is clean. And that over the whole 4K UHD image is going to lead to better dynamic range and shadow performance. Number three, Canon put false color into the C70 so you can actually use that on the built-in monitor. Now, if I wanted false color to make sure I was exposing my image properly with my C200, I could turn that on in an external monitor, like on a small HD focus or something like that, but you didn't have false color in the C200. So that left you with using the, the tiny waveform monitor on the screen or turning on zebras and making sure that you have the highlights and the shadows not clipped and stuff like that. But having false color enables you to get a quick view of the entire image quickly. So when you're on the, on the go, running and gunning, trying to get the shots that you want to get, you can see, okay, my shadows and my highlights are okay, skin tones are great, turn false color back off, keep recording. The fourth reason is something I actually don't have yet. I just got my C70 in and just unboxed it before filming this video. Go up here if you wanna watch the unboxing to see everything that comes with the C70. But the fourth thing is the full frame adapter for EF lenses. This is not shipping yet. I don't know of anybody that has this other than people that maybe had a pre-production model. It's shipping in a few weeks and I'll probably make a video about my thoughts about it. But essentially what it does, is it enables you to adapt your EF lenses to this RF mount and also makes them basically a full frame image. There's barely any crop onto the Super 35 sensor with putting EF lenses on that. Definitely something I'm excited to try because I have a bunch of EF uh, L series lenses that I don't wanna just, you know, waste. And the, one of the biggest issues with shooting on my C100 Mark IIs or my C200s is that Super 35 sensor and the crop you get when you put an EF lens on it. So trying to get a nice wide angle on something is always a little bit harder. So I'm definitely curious to try out that adapter and kind of see how it changes which lenses I grab when I go out to shoot. Next up is number five, the ability to use RF lenses. Now, Canon is going hard into RF lenses. They've already moved over their, their standard stills or hybrid cameras. Uh, with the EOS R series and the R5 and R6. And, you know, they're not really announcing any more new EF lenses. And I do have six L series EF lenses. And then I have three, I think, like EFS lenses 
and um, and then I have a Sigma 18 to 35 lens that I feel like everyone has. But I know the future is RF, and so I was waiting to kind of fully dive into RF lenses until Canon was going to commit with a camera, a cinema camera specifically, that had the ability to use RF lenses. Reason number six is I actually wanted a smaller camera body. I know a lot of people like the modularity of the Canon cinema line because you can take off the hand grip or take off the, the top handles and the, and the LCD screens and you know mod it out and put out put on V mounts and, and rig it out on your shoulder and mat boxes and all that kind of stuff. But honestly, I don't really want that out of my cameras and how I'm using them. I want to pack them down into an even smaller size. I don't really care if my camera looks bigger and is more professional. Honestly, that's actually only hindered me to not be able to shoot in certain places. Like when I was in Paris trying to film outside the Louvre, we got stopped because I was using a C100 and you know, it looked more professional. If I was filming on something like this that looked like a kind of a more consumer grade camera, they might not have said anything to me. So when I'm packing, I, I don't wanna have to like take the camera apart. Honestly, if, if I'm going somewhere and the camera is in a bag and it's, you know, dismantled and I can't just like pick it up and start shooting quickly, I'm gonna shoot less stuff, especially when I'm traveling. And not that I travel during COVID right now, but you know, I, I want something that isn't as modular. So having it be this small is actually a, a pro for me. The seventh reason is that it only uses SD cards. And so I don't need to use CFast 2.0 cards or have those card readers around and travel with if I'm gonna be shooting raw on my C200, which I ended up just not shooting very much of. So sticking with SD cards, I already have a lot of SD cards. I have a lot of V30 SD cards. I know that you need V60 and V90 to do some of the recording. Uh, with this camera, so I'll probably have to upgrade if I do want to do some of the 4K 120 and stuff like that with this camera. Um, so I, I basically am waiting to buy new memory cards until I can test to see, you know, what my my SanDisk Extreme Pros can can handle if they can handle the all i 4K or not at 24 or 30 and 60. So I don't know. I, I will have to buy more memory cards, but the fact that they're all SD cards and that's more of what I have. That's a perk. Reason number eight is actually something really big for the workflow that I have with an editor of mine. So I have a full-time editor that works with me. I still do some editing, try to at least do polishing and things like that on edits, but my editor lives in another state. So when I go and film a project, I either have to mail a hard drive with all the footage, wait for all of the full original qualities to upload to them, which can take a really long time, or I have to make proxies. With the C100 Mark II, I could record full quality on one SD card and proxies to the other, which is great. On the C200, you could record raw to the CFast 2.0 cards and a proxy to the SD cards, but you cannot record to both SD cards a full quality 8-bit file and a lower quality proxy file. But the C70, you can record full quality 10-bit 422 to one SD card and a lower quality you know, 1080p or 720p proxy to the second SD card. This will enable me for when I'm filming stuff where I don't want a redundant copy to also be full quality. You know, I'm filming this kind of stuff, YouTube things on my own, where I don't mind if I have to re-record it. I can record full resolution to one card, proxy to the other card, take out just the proxy cards first, get those uploaded going to my editor. It's gonna speed up the time that I had to transcode a bunch of files to get them proxies. So it's just gonna be a big uh, time savings for me in, in my workflow. And if that's something that you would need to do either yourself because your computer's not fast enough to handle the 10-bit 422, so you wanna just have proxies on your computer also that you can just toggle on and off in Premiere, Final Cut, or Resolve, or whatever, and just enable some smoother playback while you're doing the edit, turn back on the original files for the export, it's just gonna really speed up my process. Number nine is better quality slow motion and just more settings and features when you're shooting in slow motion. So on the C200, you get 120p in 1080p, basically. So 120 frames per second in 1080p. And I believe the autofocus is disabled. Let me check. I mean, what I just looked up and I seem to remember this is that if you go from 60p to 120p in the C200, you lose autofocus. So if you want, you know, 120 frames per second, you're going to lose autofocus, which is is hard. You know, to to set focus on something, switch to the 120p mode, 
then record it, hope that it stays in focus, or having to use manual focus. Anyway, the C70 gives you full autofocus performance in 4K 120p, and it also does 180p, 180 frames per second in 1080p, and I believe that keeps autofocus. I'm not sure on that one, but anyway, I'm probably not gonna be using the 180p very much. I'll just be using the 120 frames per second in 4K with autofocus enabled. That's a big bonus. Number 10 is touchscreen operation. The Canon C200 has a pretty decent screen. You could view it decently well outside. I did have a lens hood that I would use with it to, to you know, get, cover some of those glares, but the screen on the C70 is a touchscreen. Now you can use that for autofocus features, touching on what you wanna focus on, um, trying to do some tracking as well of subjects, but specifically some of the menu options they have with the touchscreen are gonna be much faster than going into the full menus that you have to do with the Canon C200. So their quick menu enables you to change different things like your ISO, your aperture, your, your shutter angle, things like that, as well as other settings like the bit rate you're recording in and, and getting into slow motion, stuff like that. So that touchscreen should speed up the operation to be able to do stuff faster. Number 11 is time code sync. Now this is not something I use right now because the C200 and C100s don't have a time code BNI port on them. Um, I've tried to finagle it over HDMI into my Sound Devices Mix Pre series, but it's just never really worth it. And I just, you know, clap and sync all the cameras and stuff like that. But the ability for the C70 to have time code sync in it will enable me to have multiple C70s or then use it with a C300 Mark III or what have you, and actually use time code to sync the multicam on and a bigger shoot, a bigger production, instead of having to just depend on the audio to sync stuff. So that should help too. And the 12th reason is just better battery life. And I don't really complain about the Canon C200's battery that much because I used to shoot on a RED and I know how long those RED Volt XLs last. Um, so it's not that bad on a C200, but you are going to get better battery life on this. Uh, a BPA 30 should give you around three hours. A BPA 60 should give you somewhere around six to seven hours. So honestly with with a 30 and a 60 or two 30s and a 60, I mean, that's 12 hours. Like it, it might change how I how I record stuff. I might just leave the camera on and always just be on the ready to, to record things when I'm running gunning. So um, that would be the 12th reason. Now it's not all good news. Like I'm going to be losing some things not using a C200 uh, and switching over to a C70. Uh, the first one is I'm not, I'm not gonna have SDI out. So that is something that I, didn't have before the C200. I don't really have that many SDI devices that I'm using. Uh, I do love those cables and that they lock in place and you can do longer runs without degradation of the, the signal and things like that. But for most of the things that I'm doing, I can use HDMI. I, can, I have monitors that I can use that are HDMI, recorders that are HDMI, uh, a Black Tem A10 Mini Pro that's HDMI. So the SDI is not a game changer for me personally, you would know if it is for you, depending on how many monitors you need on your camera, if you need to run SDI for some other reason to do a wireless Teradect for someone to pull focus, you know, you'll know whether or not you need SDI. I don't think I really need it. The second reason is raw recording, the ability to record Canon Cinema raw light. And I'll go more into detail on that in a second after I say the few other things that I will not have on the C70 that I have on the C200. So I'll just, I'll save my thoughts on that, but this currently does not record raw as of December, 2020. I don't think that they will put raw in the camera. They might possibly enable some sort of raw recording out of the HDMI, but I wouldn't bank on it. Canon usually doesn't upgrade, upgrade their firmware to anything substantial other than to fix an issue that they have or enable new lenses to work with the camera. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath on that. The third thing I won't have any longer is full-size XLR cables. Now, yes, all the XLR cables I have are full-size. I will have to use adapters, um, basically dongles to, to, to make it a mini XLR input. But from what I've researched and what I've read about the C70, you basically have all of the same audio recording options you just have a different sized XLR port because of just size limitations. So you can still record two XLR cables at the same time and a mic jack and a scratch track from the built-in camera. So in theory, you could run two wireless lavaliers into the XLR port 
a shotgun microphone into the mic port and then have scratch audio as well. So you're still able to record four channels of audio on this, just the XLR ports are smaller. You have the same switches and dials and stuff behind the LCD screen on the C70 that you have on the side of the C200 to be able to enable phantom power, make it a line input, adjust the volume, all that stuff. The fourth thing I won't have is the modular design. And I talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, the ability to break down the C200 or, you know, buy cages and rigs and arms and, and really mod it out to what you want to move, to move the recording handle down here and have the camera up on your shoulder or to just adjust it. You're not gonna do that very well with this. I mean, even the side hand grip doesn't rotate. It's built directly onto the camera body. So that's a deal changer for you because you're filming you know, above your head or really down low a bunch. Like these are the things to consider when you're looking at a C70 versus a C200. The fifth thing I lose by switching from the C200 to the C70 is actually something that I'm pretty bummed about. And it's the electronic viewfinder. Now I don't use it often. I would say most of the filming I do is tripod, monopod, gimbal, that sort of style. So I'm not really looking into the electronic viewfinder. It's been a while since I've done a lot of projects where I'm actually hand holding the camera, looking through the viewfinder and not just maybe hand holding the camera and just using the LCD screen because I'm inside. But the electronic viewfinder is not something you have in this camera. So it does feel weird. It kind of reminds me of shooting on like 5D Mark III's where you can't look through the optical viewfinder when you're recording in video mode because you can't see what's going on because the shutter is up. But, you know, the ability to use a viewfinder when you're outside or as another point of contact when you're filming is helpful. You know, so th this kind of reminds me of the Canon XC10 or XC15 where they actually sold a loop viewfinder that you could attach to the back of and put it up to your eye and that was essentially your electronic viewfinder. And I mean, that's what viewfinders are. They're just a smaller screen with some sort of magnification that you can adjust to, to have it up to your eye. So I imagine there will be loops that people create specifically for the C70. Um, you know, Zacuto or whoever else maybe will make one. And if I am filming outside, I'll, I'll maybe use that. But from what I've heard, the screen on this is pretty bright or I could always use, you know, like a 3000 nit brightness monitor on top if, if that was really an issue. So I'll deal with it basically. <laughs> Now let's talk about this camera not having cinema raw light. I mean, obviously at the price point they're pushing this and at the size of this, there's not probably enough computing power and fans and everything needed to do raw recording or the higher, you know, quality memory cards. You know, there's not space to put a CFast 2.0 card in this to get to that Canon cinema raw light. Um, but I'm okay with that. And honestly, for my workflow, editing in Premiere Pro with my editor who lives in another state, you know, I tried to implement Canon Cinema Raw Light into our workflow, but I just never really filmed on it on my C200. It just, it slowed everything down for me. From the larger file size to slowing down my computer during the editing and exporting process. And then if I didn't want the editing to slow down, I had to make proxies or, you know, record those into the camera and then send those to my editor over Dropbox or Frame.io. And, you know, I wanted to be able to color grade more in Canalog 2 using the RAW, but it's just never really been worth the hassle to me. And a lot of the times I'm recording with multiple cameras and I didn't have multiple C200s. So if I was going to be recording uh, the main angle on a Canon C200 and then the two other angles on Canon C100 Mark IIs that don't have Canalog 2 or 3, don't have RAW, are filming in 8-bit, you know, 1080p, you know, like what, what was the point of filming raw on one camera and then not on the other cameras if I'm going to be switching between all of them for a multi-camera shoot. And honestly, the noise in the C200 Cinema Raw Light always really bugged me a lot too. Even when I overexposed by two stop, stops, the raw files just, it's noisier. It's not being processed by the camera to clean up some of that noise. For the kind of work I do, I didn't have time to wait for neat video to denoise all of the video files on the hours and hours of exports I was doing for my clients. Another issue with the C200 is you don't have the ability to accurately monitor Canalog 2 anyway. On the C200, when you're filming in RAW, it only shows you C-Log or C-Log 3 properly in the monitor. So you basically have to guess 
how you're exposing your image on your C200 using Canalog 2. This is supposedly fixed in the C70 and I can properly expose my image using false color. And I also don't have to overexpose by a stop or two. I can properly expose at the level you're supposed to, crazy idea, to make sure the shadows are clean and the highlights are saved because that DGO, that dual gain output will you know, kind of replace having to, to, to adjust for that and should provide a cleaner image. So I'm really excited to try that with this camera. I haven't tried it yet, but from the tests I've seen from CVP and other people on YouTube and elsewhere, it's, it's, it's a good camera. It has basically the same dynamic range as a C300 Mark III at half the price. Now let's talk about the math behind this, maybe some of the business, the money stuff. So I sold my C200 used for $4,500. And since I bought it used almost two years ago for $5,500 cash, this upgrade or side grade to the C70 will only have me out about $1,000. So honestly, I use the camera a lot in those two years, pay $1,000 to rent it more or less for that time frame, and the cost only went down a little bit. And you know, I'll still have some extra batteries and other things that work on this as well that I've bought for the C200. It, it's, it's not a bad deal. But is it worth it to you if you're considering buying either one of these, not transferring from a C200 to a C70, it's a different discussion. Is the C200 a terrible, obsolete camera? Absolutely not. The APIT image of the C200 is the best I've ever seen in any cameras. And if you're willing to go through the workflow of shooting Cinema Raw Light, you can get even better, more amazing results from that camera, even more dynamic range. For me, with older computers and an editor in another state, Raw just wasn't worth it to me. The form factor is outstanding on the C200. The autofocus is amazing. And if you bought it today, this three-year-old camera, the C200, could give you another three to five years of filming great 4K footage. So honestly, there's a lot of them on the market right now because people are flipping them to upgrade to the C300 Mark III or to get the C70 or switch to Sony or you know what, what people do with cameras. I definitely buy an upgrade every few years and it's, it's not a bad idea to get a camera used. I saved couple thousand dollars buying my used, mine used when I did. So, you know, the C200 is still a great camera. I would still recommend it to a lot of people. I am still selling it to somebody that's going to make great work out of it. So, you know, don't let that dissuade you from the C200. I just, for my work, the C70, I think, is the better camera for what I need for my workflow, for the kind of work I do. And so I'm going to switch to it. If you enjoyed this video, definitely subscribe to my channel below. I'm going to be putting out a bunch of videos about the C70 as I open it up. The unboxing is up here and I start to test it out. Those will be some of my next videos. And if you want to watch the full review of my C200 from a few years ago when I rented it, it was actually before I bought it, you can watch that video here. It's I think it's almost a half hour long about the C200. So if you somehow made it this far in this video and you're still considering a C200, watch that full review. I've been Caleb Bojic. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you in another C70 video probably. Cheers.